You're locked into Inception Radio Network, Superior, Wisconsin. Welcome to Just Energy Radio with your host, naturopath and medical intuitive, Dr. Reed Louise. We have learned from Einstein's theory that matter and energy are one. Physicists believe that all systems in nature have their own particular way of vibrating, from the swinging of a pendulum to the waves of the ocean to the light that brightens the sky each day. Each of these oscillates at its own unique rate. The same holds true for every thought, feeling, event, or word we speak. Each has its own frequency or rate of vibration. What many of us don't realize is when we take everything in our universe down to its simplest form, it is all just energy. Join Dr. Rita Louise on a journey through time and space where past, present, and future collide. Today, what you believe may be called into question. What we want to know is, who made up the rules? Be brave and step outside the box. We are about to turn our world upside down and venture into the unknown. Hold on. We are departing our own beliefs and entering alternative realms. Enjoy the possibilities. Hello and welcome to Just Energy Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Rita Louise, and thank you all for tuning into the show today. Just Energy Radio is brought to you by SoulHealer.com, where you can find out about all the products and services I offer, including medical intuition evaluations, energy healing, and intuitive counseling. Uh, it's also brought to you by the Institute of Applied Energetic, where you can go to www.appliedenergeticsinstitute.com and download our free 50-page Jumpstart Your Intuition guidebook to start you on the road to opening yourself up to working as a medical intuitive, intuitive counselor, or energy medicine practitioner. So some exciting news. I have sort of, not 100%, moved into a new very, very old house, um, which <laughs> I'm having huge internet problems tonight. Um, so I just hope you all bear with me. But for my ghosty friends, I spent my first night here last night and already had found a ghost in the house. And so hopefully um, he will be very nice to me and kind to me and let me uh, keep broadcasting and not shut me down because you know how those ghosties are. They get kind of cranky when you start to broadcasting, but so please be nice. Anyway, um, we have an exciting show today. We're going to be talking to Ted Peters about his book, and I would tell you what it is. It's like UFO, Chariots of the Gods or something, but I really have no internet connection that is working worth anything, and I would read his bio, but I can't even get that up. So we're just going to totally wing it today, and I'm going to bring Ted in and just let him introduce himself because he seems like a nice guy and knows, kind of has an idea what's going on. So, Ted, are you there? Well, Dr. Rita, if you think I'm a nice guy, that shows your intuition is working well this evening. Well, it always works well. Yes. But um, <laughs> now if I could just use my intuition to figure out why I can have five bars on my little, you know, Wi-Fi thing and not be able to connect to the internet. That makes absolutely no sense to me. Well, it is beyond my intuitive powers at this point in time. Well, it's the ghost in the machine. That's the problem. I know. So. Well, you know, that's what I always say. <laughs> well, I can uh, introduce myself. That is actually subject matter about which I know a considerable amount. Um, I'm a UFO investigator, among other things, and uh, have been interested in that subject since I was, oh, maybe 11, 12, 13 years old or something like that when my mother and father would uh, read all the new UFO books and uh, they would go to hear lectures by George Adamski or whomever uh, else um, uh, would be available, you know, to talk about this subject. So I got fascinated as a kid. Then um, when I grew up, went to the university, and of course nobody in the university believes anything like that. I put away childish toys for a while, but I eventually became a, 
Lutheran pastor and a theologian, and now I specialize in Berkeley on the relationship between science and religion. And within that context, I've retrieved my childhood interest in uh, flying saucers and UFOs. I joined MUFON, Mutual UFO Network, spent a few years as uh, an investigator interviewing people who would see daylight discs or fly-by-nights or uh, even some abduction cases, etc., and have been uh, doing a fair amount of research now uh, for uh, many decades and have this new book, UFOs, God's Chariots, which is actually a revision of uh, the first edition, which came out in the 1970s, and I had thought I'd written the final book, but then in the late 1980s and early 1990s, the phenomenon changed a little bit when we introduced those very negative experiences that people were having with abductions, uh, taking aboard um, uh, a hovering UFO, uh, getting uh, examined in some cases, pregnancies and the raising of hybrid uh, children uh, and uh, dark and menacing kinds of uh, experiences. And so I had to write this revision then to try to integrate this new this new dimension uh, to uh, the phenomenon, which by and large has remained stable since 1947, but uh, these uh, uh, dark experiences of abuse and things like that uh, that's relatively new and uh, has a corner, just one corner, uh, on the much larger UFO pie. Well, we are going to get into all of that tonight. But let's Good. go back to something that you uh, mentioned earlier, that you have become very involved in the relationship between science and religion, which, you know, I believe that science is finally catching up to what uh, philosophical systems, I'm not even going to say religion, but philosophical systems around the world have been saying for a long time. You know, and, and one of my beliefs is that we had the knowledge of science, we had the knowledge of quantum physics in antiquity, which turned into a religion. So what have you found in that area, and what, what do you believe is the relationship between science and religion? Well, Dr. Uh, Rita, I am pleased to hear that. Uh, I hang around a lot with research scientists, and they think that religion is old-fashioned, anachronistic, and out of date, and that the more highly evolved you are, the more scientific and technological you become. So it's refreshing uh, to think that, hey, there might be some great wisdom in the ancient world, and I genuinely uh, believe that in the philosophical systems of uh, Plato and Aristotle, uh, you just can't beat that for wisdom and uh, knowledge, and then um, a great deal of uh, insight. Uh, I'm a biblical Christian, and a great deal of insight uh, has come through that uh, tradition in Israel as well. And uh, yes, there was a great deal of knowledge. Uh, they didn't have the technology that we do, but oh, those ancients certainly had a lot of knowledge. Now, um, with regard to uh, your question, gee, I ignored your question. How did I do that? Maybe my intuition isn't working. Uh, but your, your question is, what's my take on uh, science and religion? Well, in Berkeley, we have a center, a uh, research center. It's called the Center for Theology and the Natural Sciences. We publish a journal called Theology and Science. And we deal with uh, what some people call the hard sciences, the natural sciences. We don't deal with uh, psychology or sociology very much, but uh, we certainly like physics and biology and deal with the evolution controversy and the genetics controversy and things of that nature. And at minimum, we would like to see dialogue to think that natural science is a domain of knowing uh, the theology is uh, uh, a counter domain of knowing within um, religious tradition and that these two ought to carry on a dialogue. But in some rare cases, they can actually have interaction. That is to say, what we learn about the natural world from science could actually prompt a person of faith to ask theological questions. Uh, conversely, uh, there are some occasions when 
uh, what we understand through our inherited wisdom in the religious tradition um, will prompt a scientific research program as well, especially anthropology. What What is human nature? Well, there's a lot of wisdom in the religious traditions about that one. And um, we certainly uh, uh, think uh, that there are uh, times and openings in scientific research for studying that one. But um, more to the point here about tonight's discussion, we have a project in Berkeley. We call it Astrotheology and Astroethics. And we want to take a look at the field of astrobiology and related uh, space sciences, reflect on those, ask what could be the religious implications of extraterrestrial life, especially intelligent life, and then what are the ethical issues having to do with um, space exploration as we earthlings uh, leave our planet and uh, go elsewhere within the solar system and who knows, uh, maybe beyond at some point uh, in the distant future. So that's my bag of tricks there, Dr. Rita. Well, I'm just, I mean, I, I'm going to classify myself just to kind of put a little box around it as kind of an ancient alien kind of gal, you know, and ancient you made the alien. comment that Ancient alien, mm-hmm. say what? Ancient kind alien? of gal. You're an ancient alien kind of gal. Okay, good. Yeah, you know, and I have very specific reasons. It's not just because other people say it's cool. It's because yeah. I've done a lot of research, and based on my research, it becomes really hard to go anywhere else, at least to me. With yeah. that said, you know, you said that we have more technology than the ancients did. But when we start looking around the world, you know, it's like the pyramids or the walls inside of Oman, how they cut them so intricately. And, and some of the other marvels that we see, it's hard to say that they didn't have some kind of technology that we obviously can't replicate. Well, certainly there are marvels at the dawn of civilization. The Egyptian pyramids are probably the most uh, startling. Um, and I suppose if you're an ancient astronaut kind of gal, uh, then <laughs> you might uh, think that those Egyptians could have got jump started by borrowing some technology from outer space. But it's my understanding from Egyptologists that the instructions on how to build a pyramid are written right inside there in uh, hieroglyphics and uh, story pictures. We even know in some cases the names of the architects and the uh, the general contractors. <laughs> and, uh, in, uh, I have a hunch that the Egyptians didn't need um, extraterrestrial intelligence for uh, their pyramids. I've made one visit to uh, Egypt, and you can see how over time uh, the concept of the pyramid grew. I mean, the early pyramids were kind of crude and small, and they seem to learn through trial and error how to make a great big uh, uh, pyramid. So um, I'm not persuaded that our ancestors needed extraterrestrial uh, aid, at least in that uh, in that uh, project. So, um, And I was just using that as an example. Yes, okay. yes, I know, but we've got many more examples. What you want to talk about the Mayans? <laughs> and uh, I, I, I love this material, by the way. I tend to be a little bit more demanding, I think, of uh, evidence than some of those who um, advance the ancient a- uh, alien theory. But probably like you, I watch uh, history too. It goes. It's a uh, on almost constantly in our house because I love all those uh, documentaries about uh, examining one or another ancient archaeological site or one or another ancient uh, scripture and uh, trying to interpret them in light of uh, aliens. I love all that stuff. I'm probably a little bit slower maybe than you are to um, conclude that um, alien intelligence is a good explanation for those things. Well, and see, in my research, I looked at the mythological record. You know, by the time we got to architecture and any building stuff, you know, I, I, 
I, I let it go. You know, by the time civilization started, I was like, okay, I'm done. Because, <laughs> you know, the mythology predates, you know, writing. So, you know, uh, so that's where mine yeah. comes from. It doesn't come from any of the, uh, mm -hmm. you know, architectural sites, you know, and the yeah. monumental statues or anything. Because to me, that's, that's much later than, you know, the creation of man and the flood story and, you know, all of the little cosmic battles that they were constantly having. Right, right. Which brings us back to our topic about uh, uh, God's chariot. You know, so let me ask you this. Let's kind of go back on point. You know, there are many people that, you know, have been exposed to the ancient alien theory. Um, could the chariots that are described in this do you think that they are actually reports of UFOs in antiquity? Well, I give two answers to the question, are UFOs God's chariots or not? And uh, the first one has to do with the ancient astronaut theorists. That's where I got started trying to respond to Eric von Däniken and others who were uh, trying to show that our ancient ancestors, both in ancient Israel as well as uh, other ancient societies, uh, were describing in their myths and in their literature, were describing supernatural experiences with spiritual symbols and signs and that these could be mistaken uh, hovering or landing flying saucers or spaceships or whatever. Well, let me just say I'm intrigued uh, by that uh, particular argument, but the more I look... Uh, carefully at uh, texts or at many of the arguments. I just don't find it a strong argument. And I, uh, one, of the, one of the things that bothers me a little bit about ancient astronaut theorists, at least those that we see on History 2 on television, is the assumption that there could not have been in the past actual gods or goddesses, or there would not be a god, and there probably was not even any spiritual dimensions to reality. Therefore, the only uh, plausible explanation is science and technology and some kind of material uh, reality. And what I, what I find missing in ancient astronaut theories, and, and uh, maybe, Rita, this bothers you too, I don't know, what I find missing is a sense of spiritual depth or uh, that symbols can have, ancient religious symbols can have uh, multiple meanings. So my first answer to the question, are UFOs God's chariots, is going to be a cautious negative. However, I have a yes answer to this question, too, and it deals much more with the contemporary UFO phenomenon, which I date, as many do, beginning in June 1947 and running down to the present time. And when we hear a message from a UFO knot in outer space delivered through uh, an earthling, a contactee or an abductee, most frequently, that message is prophetic in character, just like the prophets of ancient Israel. And uh, it usually goes something like this. If we don't put away our weapons of mass destruction, if we don't stop nuclear testing, um, we are going to pay the consequences. Or more recently, the euphonauts tell us that uh, we are destroying our planet and we need to repent from our activities uh, in order to preserve our planet. So um, I, I asked the question, well, could the UFOs then be messengers from God? Well, I think so, but that's because of the quality of the message. Uh, it's, uh, it's a divine demand, basically, to uh, shape up, um, or else we're going to risk some kind of uh, self-destruction. So there's a no and a yes answer to the question, are UFOs God's chariots? But see, I mean, that works for me, you know, I mean, because if you think about it, and I'm, you know, we have like um, Enoch, who went to the heavens and hung out with God, and he had to get there somewhere, you know, I would think it would be, you know, I mean, unless he was having a uh, kind of out of body, you know, etheric experience where he was communicating with the angels, um, 
you know, that kind of thing. Um, and so if it was happening back then, I mean, I don't see why they would necessarily stop now or that phenomenon would stop now. But anyway. Well, well I, let me just say I find a certain plausibility to that. I, I don't find it absolutely convincing. But, yeah, I, I, it is certainly possible. Um, am I going to use that explanation for everything that I find unusual in the ancient world? No, I'm not going to do that. No. But yes, and yes, you could imagine Enoch on board a um, uh, a flying saucer. I, I could, yes. So let's talk about your comment about the different um, messages that they come back with. Um, you know, because I've only well, I've had a couple of people come on that were experiencers, but only one, and of course, you know, his name totally escapes me in this moment, um, has come on and, and talked about the message that he received because he was a multiple of that the, um, you know, which is very similar to what you were talking about, that, you know, we all need to get along, you know, and take care of our planet. But is that a fairly consistent thing that people have experienced that have been abducted. I mean, we're going to talk about the negative kind. So let's just talk about, let's talk about the positive kind first. Yeah, let's uh, start with the positive because I think the positive is uh, overwhelmingly more significant than the negative. What I do in the book is grant that UFOs are a mysterious phenomenon that has uh, prompted uh, a reaction amongst us in culture and individually. And so I offer the reader four models of interpretation that visitors from outer space um, could look like political visitors. I call it the interstellar diplomat. Or uh, most frequently, they kind of look like Earth scientists. When our uh, first visit to the moon and contemporary research on Mars, what do scientists do? They run around collecting sand and dirt and provide an analysis. And funny thing, um, when we get visitors from outer space, they uh, collect artifacts and they do uh, physical examinations on the bodies of people that uh, they abduct. And they it kind of fit the scientific model. And then finally, or the third one, I call celestial savior, the, the bringer of salvation. And the salvation that they bring is usually not spiritual transformation, but in some cases it is. It's, it's usually um, uh, peace on earth, uh, how to uh, prevent us from uh, destroying ourselves through uh, war or something like that. And if you take a look at the great contactees of the 1950s and 60s, uh, this was the message that uh, you heard again and again. And those that became UFO-oriented religions usually had this uh, at the heart um, at the heart of their uh, message. So um, the uh, people who claim to have been abducted in the 60s and 70s and early 80s, um, thought of their abductors as either uh, coming here for political reasons, usually peace, uh, or to negotiate peace, uh, but still with a threat. Um, the predominant one was uh, the scientists who are here doing research, especially biological research on human bodies, and then um, this prophetic message, uh, we want you earthlings to stop killing yourselves. Uh, and uh, then later in the 80s and 90s, the message had, be, uh, had to do with the environment. Let's protect ourselves uh, from the environment. So uh, I want to say these are broad cultural strokes, but you find them strongly accented in the UFO phenomenon, uh, the most dramatic dimensions of which are the uh, abductions and the contact he claims, uh, to be sure, but uh, even in um, uh, non-close encounters frequently, uh, you'll ask a person with that kind of a UFO experience, what do they think? And they usually think, oh, there's scientists coming here to do research, or 
um, they found a way to live without war and they're going to help us do that or something like that. So I use the word myth a little bit cautiously, but I, I want to say it's sort of a framework of belief uh, with which we operate and it's not unique to the UFO phenomenon. To some extent, it's uh, it's uh, a wide cultural thing and even many natural scientists who are engaged in space research happen to believe uh, in this same um, this framework, so that's that's uh, one of the main themes I have here in this book. The people that have come back with these messages, um, you know, it's not really a credibility question, but it's more, you know, their personal philosophy. You know, and I'm not sure if you can even answer this. You know, I mean, there are people that are obviously that are going to be more eco-friendly or more society-friendly, and then there are people that just don't really even care. You know, it, has there been any kind of analysis of who the people are and kind of what their backgrounds were that are coming back with these messages, you know, that might be just really outside of their natural or previous mindset? Uh, that's a good question, Dr. Rita. And as far as I know, um, no. Uh, certainly in some cases where a person has been devoutly religious in advance of the abduction, uh, the abduction experience seems to reinforce and enhance um, their, you know, uh, religious uh, commitments. It doesn't seem to contradict them, <laughs> but it enhances them, which I find uh, quite interesting. On the other hand, there are some instances, uh, Dr. Rita, that I'm thinking about here, where it looks like there's a turnaround. Um, maybe later on we can talk about my interaction with Dr. John Mack, who uh, dealt with those who had the very negative um, experiences. Um, and he said that what the people who experienced abductions told him was that the whole experience turns out to be a religious experience and it takes the form of a new love that they didn't have before, but a new love and a new appreciation for the planet. Well, um, Dr. Mack, unfortunately, has passed away, but uh, what kind of a guy was he? Well, <laughs> he was very eco-friendly, and uh, so maybe that's what he wanted to hear. But uh, nevertheless, he was a research scientist, and he did say that's what people told him. And uh, from, from their point of view, they were having a conversion experience, a conversion toward loving planet Earth as a result of their abduction experience. So uh, that's uh, still hearsay, but I think, Dr. Rita, you're asking a good question. It would be interesting to do a quantitative analysis of abductees and try to measure um, what they thought religiously prior to their experience, what they thought afterward. Uh, you know, let's find a graduate student and uh, put them on that problem. Mm -hmm. You know, and it almost sounds similar, in a very global kind of way, to people that have had near-death experiences. You know, they, they have their experience, you know, they, they meet Jesus, or they, you know, they meet whoever, and, you know, come back with a very different outlook, you know, on life, on their interaction on the planet, you know, many of them come back, uh, opened up to their psychic abilities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you know, and it makes me wonder, you know, because you know, people tell me stuff, and then, like, that little brain goes off. If the people, quote-unquote, that they're meeting during these near-death experiences are the same beings that people that are having the abduction experiences are meeting, even though one are obviously not corporal and the other one's more corporal in nature. Yes, I. that's a reasonable uh, question to pose, and there there was some literature in the 80s, um, maybe into the 90s, I'm not remembering, where uh, authors did try to conflate the UFO phenomenon with the uh, NDEs, the near-death experiences, and uh, just the kind of thing that you described there is uh, what they report. 
Uh, I have to say um, I'm uh, confused um, about the UFO phenomenon in broad strokes because uh, even though um, it's obvious that uh, the UFO phenomenon is an umbrella under which all kinds of different uh, interests and groups and uh, uh, points of view uh, huddle. Uh, but uh, one difference would be um, uh, implied in what you just said here that uh, the dominant group, um, I belong to MUFON, Mutual UFO Network, the dominant group there are the nuts and bolts people. So that flying saucers are craft and uh, ufonauts are pilots and passengers in these craft and they travel to earth just like you and I would get on an airplane and uh, perhaps fly to New York City or something like that. Um, on the other end, um, we have uh, people engaged in New Age uh, spirituality or um, uh, you know variants on that for whom uh, the ufonauts are spiritual beings. They're not physical. And uh, they can exist in your my psyche and provide advice and care on a day-to-day -day basis. And when it gets conflated with uh, Gnosticism, then um, the UFOs come from different levels uh, on the astral plane. And... Um, so uh, all of these things fit within the UFO phenomenon. I tend to gravitate towards the nuts and bolts uh, kinds of people uh, because uh, when we start talking about visitors from space on an astral plane that in, uh, in enters your or my psyche, well, there's nothing distinctive about the UFO there. I mean, that's a, a form of spirituality that we've had for 2,000 plus years uh, in in Western consciousness, and uh, I, I just see it as one more uh, variant um, uh, on that. And uh, I don't want to be dismissive. I just want to say uh, I have a hard time, and this is where I'm confused. I have a hard time getting those two together, uh, even though. Uh, when I go to UFO meetings, I find representatives of both the nuts and bolts group and the spiritualist group, and everybody's happy with one another, and uh, it's rah-rah, but I do find a certain incoherency uh, as we put them together. Well, and it's not to say that there aren't both, that there aren't nuts and bolts ETs and, you know, beings without bodies that we interact with oh. <laughs> that, you know... I mean, because people get mad at me because I'll sit there and, you know, talk about ghosts, which are beings without bodies, and I'll throw angels right in there with them because they're also beings right. without bodies, you know, and I can throw a non-corporeal extraterrestrial right on in there because, you know, a being is a being is a being, in my, my opinion. Yeah. Well, angels are non-corporeal intelligent entities, could there be an alien who's a non-corporeal um, intelligent entity? Billy Graham, the great evangelist, wrote a book in 1976, if I'm not mistaken, in which he raised the question, could um, aliens and flying saucers actually be what the Bible meant by angels? And he granted that a positive. <laughs> he said he hopes that uh, somewhere in space uh, there are um, beings uh, who are intelligent and closer to God than we are here on earth, he said. And uh, for Billy Graham, there wasn't any problem in thinking about angels and aliens uh, all together. So if it's good enough for him, I guess it's good enough for me. Well, see, I've never heard that. So, you know, even though I maybe wasn't a Billy Graham fan. Maybe I'm going to give him a little, you know, bump up. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you can find his book uh, in the library or online, I'm sure. But, um, no, very interesting. Um, I wanted to go somewhere, but I have to tell you, so my new office is like the penthouse. It's on the mm -hmm. second floor, and I have all these windows that look out into my new backyard. And somebody, I don't even know who it was, wasn't a ghost, had a body, uh, just walked through my backyard. 
Well, new experience. I never, you know, that's why. <laughs> so it kind of, kind of distracted me here just a bit. Um, maybe it was a sort of corporeal, non corporeal being person. I, um, th- I think it's an emissary from Zeta Two Reticuli who's coming to oversee what it is that you say on Just Energy Radio. <laughs> I bet that's what it is. That's it. That's it. Well, you know, one of the things I also say, I mean, because there's angels, there's spirit guides, there's ghosts, you know, and there are so many people that will channel these beings and channel these entities and believe that whatever they say is 100% gospel. And my comeback to those people is, but how do you know they're not Fred the janitor from the Zeta Reticuli, you know, and he might be like, you know, the low man on the totem pole, and now oh, yes. he's giving you advice. <laughs> That's right. Uh, giving us advice because somehow or other they couldn't uh, make it on their own planet. <laughs> or he could just get through. Right. You know? Yes. I mean, because, you know, that was something that really kind of bothered me. Personally, I mean, I don't know, do you consider yourself a person who listens to your inner guidance or your higher self or, you know, those kind of things? I mean, do you see yourself as that kind of a spiritual person? I listen to my interiority uh, almost uh, obsessively, uh, you know, uh, too much. I probably need to party a little bit more. Um so my distraction is uh, baseball. You know, that's a pretty good one. But with regard to the higher self, um, that actually is uh, is a doctrine. It's a Gnostic and a New Age doctrine. And um, I, it usually suggests some kind of um, mental connectedness uh, that we have uh, not only with each other but with various um, – Uh, other entities on the higher astral planes. And I just simply have not experienced it. Uh, Mm -hmm. I do experience, I think, the work of the Holy Spirit from time to time. And uh, maybe those who refer to the higher self, maybe they're, you know, it's just a different word for the same thing. I'm not uh, certain about that. Uh, But I'll have to say that on a day-to-day basis, I live in my lower self. (laughs) So, uh, <laughs> that's I don't know why you need the nuts and bolts. <laughs> that's why I like nuts and bolts. Yeah. I mean, I, I think for me, you know, communicating with the Holy Spirit, talking with your, you know, communicating with entities that are, you know, to your higher self, you know, kind of the same. But then again, you have to go, okay, so what are these things and are they aliens? I mean, because they obviously aren't earthbound. They're not people, like, in the way, in that nuts and bolts kind of way. Well, to me, the biggest question is not answering what they are or where they came from. My question is whether they have a message of grace uh, or not. Um, If they just turn out to be overgrown, cranky, um, you know, complaining kinds of uh, entities. I'm not too interested, but if they somehow or other uh, have a message of grace that says, you know, how can the larger reality become better, uh, more moral, more blissful, more fulfilling? Uh, I guess it's the content of the message that makes makes it more important to me than um, the nature of the messenger. And if somebody from a UFO uh, uh, says, hey, time to love your neighbor, or <laughs> um, uh, the great uh, unity of the whole cosmos is, uh, is exuding love and what we need to do is bask in it, if those kinds of messages are coming through, um, well, I just want to be grateful for that and not worry too much about who the messenger is. Very well said. I like that. Um, Good. You know, because 
I mean, I, I guess I have a very similar thought. It's kind of like, you know, a being to being is a being is a being. And, you know, as long as they're talking nice stuff, what do I care? I don't. Oh, that's right. But, um, uh, let's see. Oh, I guess we like answered that question. Oh. <laughs> well, I'm sitting here yes. looking at my little question list thing, and I'm like, oh, I guess we answered oh, that one. See, we're, we're like, and it was just the next one in line. So, see, we must have been having this like little psychic thing going on. Mm. Uh, well, you know, one of the things that I read, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that in your book you talk about how you have a feeling or what you're seeing is that a belief in extraterrestrials is kind of replacing religious belief? Yes, my, my, my larger uh, concern it has to do with religious or spiritual sensibilities. And if you um, kind of take religion out of the churches for a little bit and just take a look at our culture, what's going on? And I think that de facto, uh, we have uh, a worship of science and technology, and that gets translated into what I call the ETI myth. Uh, my wife, uh, Karen, doesn't like me to use the word myth, but I, what I mean is the structure of interpretation here. And one of the things I try to point out in this book, curiously, is that the same structure of interpretation works amongst the UFO community that works amongst SETI and some of the uh, space uh, scientists who don't want to have anything to do with the UFO people. And uh, let me let me tell you what I mean by that. And that is there's this widespread belief that's actually not scientific, but it sounds scientific. And the belief is that on other planets, life has been evolving for a longer period of time than it has here on Earth, and that it is progressive. That is to say, over time, life gets more complex, and then it produces intelligent beings who are religious, and then it evolves further further and it produces intelligent beings who are scientific and technological and then it keeps on progressing further uh, so that science and technology do what? Well, they get those races of extraterrestrial intelligent beings past the threat of nuclear war or past the threat of their uh, planetary self-degradation. And so there they are, um, a million years ahead of us or whatever, and uh, through science and technology, they have got all kinds of goodies. And so if they come to visit us, either in UFOs or with radio transmissions, in either case, they're going to provide us on Earth with advanced science and technology to do what? To bring world peace, uh, to stop the destruction of our planet, and throw in advanced medical care so that we could live longer, if not live forever. And basically, it's utopia descending from the sky. Now, all of this sounds scientific, but it's really religion in disguise. It's a religion of salvation, in disguise. And uh, I love especially the UFOs that are nuts and bolts because it shows what we really uh, worship and adore are science and technology. And so wouldn't it be great if salvation uh, were to come through uh, science and technology that we export in our imaginations uh, to these other planets? Uh, is this scientific? I want to say there is zero empirical evidence uh, for this. Is it, uh, in addition to that, the theoretical evidence is opposed to it. If you ask your renowned evolutionary biologists whether or not this could be true, they're going to say no. They're going to say no because, first of all, 
the beginning of life is not part of evolution. Secondly, once evolution does get going, it does not automatically progress towards complexity or intelligence, let alone science and technology. So um, these views that a long evolution is going to produce a uh, scientific and technological civilization that is going to come here to Earth to save us from ourselves. Well, I just want to say that really looks like ancient religion to me, and um, it is delusionary because it's packaged in scientific language, but it has no more uh, scientific credibility than any of the ancient myths of uh, Sumer and Akkad, the Bible, the Greeks, or what have you, you know. So that's one of the themes that you're going to find uh, here in this book. And I don't mean to be negative because I absolutely love science and I love space research, uh, but I just want to distinguish between hope and uh, what we can say credibly based upon empirical knowledge. Uh, I mean, I would hope that all of this is true, but empirically, well, it just doesn't stack up if you take a scientific point of view, that's all. Well, you know, and people put out these comments, and the reality is, they're just making it up. I mean, you know, I'm pretty big on saying, you know, there are a lot of people that pull stuff out of their butt and they say it's true when, well, where did they get that? <laughs> you know, I find and, and, that... And, and that whole theory that, it, you know, it's just an opinion. You know, somebody came up with it and, you know, there, it has a level of... Uh, consensus with people, but there's not any proof. It's just like there's not any proof that ghosts exist, and there's not uh, yet, I'm going to say right. yet, you know, or near-death experiences, that that's really a phenomena, you know, but there's actually more evidence of ghosts and near-death experiences than that commentary and that line of thought, even though it does sound very nice. Um, yes, I, uh, I, I do agree with uh, what you were saying a, a moment ago that it could be simply an opinion, but because there's such a widespread consensus, a lot of people holding this, it really becomes a framework of interpretation. I call it a model right. or a conceptual model. And much of the UFO phenomenon is interpreted through this uh, framework of interpretation. And that's one of the reasons why it is so um, exciting, uh, is that this framework of interpretation is so exciting. But UFOs may turn out to be something else when the mystery gets solved. Mm -hmm. I would hope that they represent extraterrestrial visitors, but it's not yet been demonstrated, at least not conclusively. Mm -hmm. You know, and for them to give us all of this stuff, they would like so be breaking the prime directive. And don't they watch Star Trek? <laughs> 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 it's just not how it works. I right. mean, unless you're Captain Kirk, you know, and, and then you get in right. trouble for it. Well, the good uh. news is that the UFO phenomenon took shape. Um, before there was a Star Trek or a Star Wars. So the UFO phenomenon is not dependent upon science fiction, uh, which I, I think is rather important to observe. Um, science fiction movies frequently will have aliens or spacecraft or something like that. But for the most part, what you get in science fiction uh, is the war model. The U.S. versus the Soviet Union simply exported to space. Um, the UFO phenomenon is really different. I think there are only two authentic UFO movies. Uh, the first one, 1951, The Day the Earth Stood Still. Not the remake, but only the original. And uh, then, in 1977, Spielberg's um, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and Spielberg reported when he was getting ready to make that movie that he was looking forward to doing a sci-fi blockbuster. But when he looked carefully at the UFO phenomenon, he said, 
This is not science fiction. This is religion. And Spielberg is just a very sensitive artist, and I want to say I think he got the message. Uh, it really has been a secular form of uh, religion, not only that, but at least partially that, um, for uh, a number of decades there. Uh, and it still is, I think, for a number of people. And I don't even want to say it's an unhealthy religion particularly, as long as it has a message of uh, world peace or something like that. Um, I think some of the UFO cults, what we prefer to call it new religious movements, some of those can be unhealthy. Uh, but they're unhealthy because they're a cult, not necessarily because of their belief, uh, belief system. So... Uh, at any rate, I'm elaborating, Dr. Rita, here on what I think is one of the central themes of this book and how it is that the UFO phenomenon fits within our larger cultural streams of consciousness and shared awareness. You know, and the scary part is, is that there is that belief um, where they're going to come and help. You know, I mean... Right. I mean, we're going to, we're going to hit a break and I want to talk about, go back to the positive messages and then move on to those negative messages. You know, but I yes. feel we'll just kind of stay where we are right now. But, you know, just that, that hope, excuse me, that hope that they're going to come and save us. And, you know, you see the same thing. I mean, I do, uh, health counseling, you know, I'm a medical yes. intuitive. I do health counseling. Right. And, um, you know, there are so many people that buy into the medical model and go to their doctor with the hope that the doctor is going to fix them. You know, and it's not that the doctor can't help them. You know, I, I don't want to dis, med, you know, medicine. Right. But I there's go to so the much that, that hope. <laughs> you know, but there's so much individuals can do to support good health that, right. you know, but they, they, they choose not to. They've been brainwashed into giving up all of that self-reliancy. And it sounds like this message is kind of the same thing. It's about giving up that self-reliancy and looking to them to take care of everything. Ooh, and I came up with another thought, but you go ahead and I'll come back. Uh, yes, I, I think having the hope for salvation is a deep inner human yearning, and I don't think there's anything uh, wrong with that. There are dimensions of our life over which we do not have control, and so to hope that someone superior to us will take control and do so for our benefit, I think that's a natural uh, human uh, yearning. And uh, religious messages in general, and certainly the Christian message in particular, uh, wants to say, well, there is a God there, and that God is actually prompting within us those hopes and uh, expectations. And uh, the gospel message would be, well, it's a, a good reason to hope because there's a God who is gracious and loving and plans on delivering. In the meantime, try to make your world a better place. Okay, so I'm going to go into a really kind of weird, dark place here for a second, you know, because we've been kind of talking about these interdimensional beings and angels and spirit guides and stuff, you know, and people getting these messages or, you know, just the foundation of this belief system that we are talking about. So this is coming from a really kind of dark place, but could it be, you know, because there's a whole lot we don't know, could it be that, you know, people are professing this message, but the message is really an alien way to get us to let up our guard because now we're going to go to them, save me, save me, and we're not going to be able to protect ourselves because we're not suspicious at all because we see them as our savior. Well, I like that stream of suspicion in you, uh, Dr. Rita, and um, uh, there is a real logic uh, to what it is that you say. I mean, even Satan is likely to tempt us by appealing to our highest values and our most uh, noble uh, inclinations. Uh, and uh, so let me just say there is nothing 
to preclude or make impossible the logic uh, of what you say there, Dr. Rita. Uh, let me just say I tend not to uh, affirm it, uh, but uh, it is certainly as possible as um, believing what they say, that's for sure. Mm-hmm. Because we don't know, really. I mean, a number of years ago, and I'll share this story. Um, a number of years ago, Barbara Hanscloud, who has become a good friend, wrote her book, The Palladian Agenda. And then there was Sheldon Nile, who wrote, we are, we are Becoming Galactic Human. You know, and I read Barbara Hanscloud's book. I loved it. You know, it was very heart-filled and loving. And then the other book was about the Syrians and the Syrians coming and they're going to like turn off the power for three days and they're going to start taking people off the planet. I don't know. I couldn't even finish the book because I was having nightmares. Right? I don't even, I don't even dream particularly. And I was having nightmares of these shifts. It was awful. And, um, and it made me just sit there and go, so what's really going on and what's the message? You know, is it really a message of love or is it a message of, well, let's be all nice and loving and kind to manipulate you from that, that level. And then these other ones are coming from a fear-based thing. So, but we don't know. Well, what I have done is draw a line between the fear-based uh, and put science fiction over on that side of the line because that seems to be what makes science fiction so exciting, at least in the movies. Uh, books are more subtle. But the UFO phenomenon pretty much from 1947 down into the late 80s was strictly positive, or at, at, at worst, it was neutral. It was kind of like an unfeeling scientist. But uh, it went from that neutrality to being really positive. These aliens are going to save us. And I just want to say descriptively, that's what the UFO phenomenon looks like. Okay. <laughs> Let me just look at the time. You know what? We are just about at the top of the hour. So why don't we go to a break right now? And come back and talk about, uh, I wrote down messages of healing, and I like that. And some talk about this uh, John May negative experiences and maybe get a little bit into the government. Sound good? All right, we'll do it. Okay. All right, I'm Dr. Rita Louise. We're here talking to Ted Peters about his book, UFO, God's Chariot. Uh, Ted, what's your web page? Ted's Timely Take dot com. All one word, Ted's Timely Take. And we'll be back with Ted after these words from our sponsors. Move past the crossroads in your life and discover alternative solutions to your deepest concerns at SoulHealer.com. So whether it's a physical problem, an emotional issue, a question about work, or troubles in your relationships, naturopath and medical intuitive Dr. Rita Louise can help bring peace, harmony, and health back into your life. Schedule a session today. Visit SoulHealer.com right away and live the life you've been dreaming of. Go deep inside yourself and venture into the realm of the unconscious mind with my Meditating on the Kabbalah guided imagery audio CDs. Discover who you are and what you want in life. Meditating on the Kabbalah can help you to open, clear, and revitalize the energetic pathways of your subtle being. They will support you in your spiritual quest by helping you to access the profound insights and inner guidance you need as you work in alignment with your highest good. Let them help you to release negative thoughts and emotions and clear away any limitations that may be keeping you from experiencing your full potential. Walk down the path to health, healing, understanding, and enlightenment with Meditating on the Kabbalah. Order your copy today at www.soulhealer.com. That's right, that's www.soulhealer.com. Before we get back to the show, I want to thank all of you for tuning into Just Energy Radio this evening. Many of the people I've helped over the years were listeners just like you. If you're at a junction in your life, 
Don't stand alone at this important time. Call me or send me an email. We can set up a private consultation so that you too can experience wholeness in your life. To find out more about the services I offer, visit soulhealer.com. Are you sensitive to energy? Want to explore the world beyond the five senses? Looking for a new career as an alternative health care practitioner? Then the Institute of Applied Energetics, Medical Intuition, and Energy Medicine Training programs may be right for you. Our comprehensive curriculum provides students with a deep understanding of how to detect, evaluate, and transform the subtle body, as well as techniques for correcting energetic imbalances that may underscore a person's ability to experience radiant health. So if you are sensitive to energy, contact the Institute of Applied Energetics right away. Be a catalyst for changing the way healthcare is done around the world. Visit www.appliedenergeticsinstitute.com and start your new career today. And now back to Just Energy Radio with Dr. Rita Louise. Welcome back to Just Energy Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Rita Louise, and thank you all for staying tuned to the second hour of the show. So if you're hanging out in the chat room, guys, hey, sorry I'm not in there with you, you know, um, internet problems. Or else, you know, I'd be in there. Well, I'm laughing here, so I hope you're laughing over there. But I just want to do a little shout out to you because I know you stress out when you think I'm not live. And it's live today. I'm just not in the chat room. Uh, we're here talking to Ted Peters about his book, UFOs, God's Chariot. And we have some really good topics that we're going to go into. So, Ted... Um, before we went to break, I wanted to kind of go back to the concept of like the messages of healing, which are the more positive and uplifting messages. And then, you know, talk about some of these negative experiences that people are having. So, I mean, is there, what kind of differences are there between the positive experiences and the negative experiences that people are having? Uh, well, Dr. Rita, this is one of the uh, primary reasons uh, for me writing the second edition of this book. I had finished it in 1977 and thought, well, I've you know, done the definitive work on the UFO phenomenon, and then the phenomenon changed. And so let me describe <clears throat> what the change was. As we discussed in the first hour, the contactees of the 1950s and 60s, the abductees of the 1960s and 70s, were all basically saying the same thing, that the extraterrestrial aliens who are visiting us are advanced in science and technology. They are concerned about peace on earth. They are concerned about the welfare of the human race. And in many cases, they outwardly love us. And that is the dominant theme um, uh, all the way uh, into the, the mid-1980s. Then something changed. When you get to the last half of the 1980s, you start getting books by Whitley Strieber, Bud Hopkins, David Jacobs, and John Mack reporting very negative UFO abduction experiences where people will be taken from their bed in the middle of the night. Uh, they'll be taken aboard a craft. Uh, the greys, who are your kind of scientific uh, lab rats, uh, then do investigations on their bodies, which actually is in continuity with the past. Um, and uh, then uh, you get uh, sexual stuff, not erotic necessarily, but reproductive in nature, so that uh, sperm is taken from the men, eggs are taken from the women. In some cases, the women are impregnated, uh, in some cases raped, etc. And so we have <clears throat> the breeding of hybrids. 
and I actually call this in the book the hybridizer model of interpretation because it's so widespread. And sometimes a mother who will give birth to a hybrid, a mixture of heaven and earth, uh, will be abducted repeatedly to help show the greys on the spacecraft how to nurture a baby. And so you get the image that the spacelings are sort of scientific kinds of people, that is to say they protect their emotions or they have no emotions, and that strong earth emotions such as motherly affection amongst others uh, need to be taught to them and that there's even a scenario that says they want to create for their benefit uh, another generation of UFO knots who benefit from Earth, uh, the, the kinds of feelings that we uh, human beings on Earth have uh, developed. But um, the point that I want to make is, the first point I want to make, is that these are negative experiences. The people who get abducted don't want to be abducted. And uh, they don't like being abused or impersonally treated. It's not as though they're actually physically harmed. It's just that they're treated impersonally when they're dealing with such personal dimensions as baby making and uh, things of that nature. Now, um, I, uh, I thought, wait a minute, this does not fit the pattern. And as you probably know, Dr. Rita, that uh, John Mack wrote the kind of definitive book called Abduction, uh, which was a, became a, a New York Times bestseller, of, I think 1973 or 74, or something like that, in which he had 17 or 18 cases, and he uh, interviewed them using hypnotic regression, and he reports them. And they're really negative. And Dr. Mack was a professor of psychiatry at the Harvard Medical School. And he was pursuing this subject. And um, I, uh, everybody who knew uh, Dr. Mack really, really liked him a lot. I did. But <clears throat> this was a problem. So I went to Boston. And uh, he, uh, conduct, he uh, conducted a seminar with all of his researchers. He had about six maybe researchers or so. And he brought in Harvey Cox, the theologian. And I made the case. I said, uh, Dr. Mack, with all due respect, I've been studying the UFO phenomenon for a long time. And what you're reporting doesn't fit the paradigm. It just doesn't fit because you are reporting such negative experiences. whereas uh, what I think has been uh, the case is that people have had virtually religious experiences uh, with UFOs prior to this. So what is the problem here? Why is it that you see things so differently than I do? I do. Well, Dr. Mack was gracious and listened, and we had a wonderful uh, discussion and he said a couple things that I thought were interesting, and this sort of warranted why I needed to revise the book. He said, you're right, uh, that these first reports when UFO abductees come to him, they report it's really negative. It's really awful. They really hate it. They're really angry. He said, but in time... They reinterpret this experience and begin to see it as a religious experience, as a watershed moment in their life, as a turning to something new. And then what was so interesting was they develop a new sense of the sacredness of planet Earth and a, a kind of a conversion, you know, to this. Well, um, I, uh, I felt good about that. When he wrote his second book in the late 1990s, before he died, um, uh, he, he tried to show uh, that even these very negative UFO abduction experiences looked more like the religious experiences that I had uh, reported. So... That was one of the things that I wanted to put into this book because 
if you were to read the earlier version of it, you would say, well, well, Ted Peters has got it all wrong. I mean, look at how all these negative experiences. But um, uh, somehow or other, if we're going to have a single comprehensive explanation, uh, we need to integrate these rather disparate things. So that's that's one of the things that's going on here uh, in this book. It's very complex, but I, I try to lay it out uh, so that uh, people, the readers, can get a handle on it. Well, I mean, I'm good friends with Nick Redburn, and he wrote a book about, you know, you used the word contactees, and actually he used that. And I think it's interesting that it went from contactees to abductees in the 60s, but we can come back to that. Um, but he talked about the contactees in the 50s and maybe the early 60s, like free Betty and Barney Hill. And, um, you know, but in those stories that he shares, um, he talks mostly about, you know, the Nordics, you know, about these, you know, blonde or albino looking human creatures that, you know, had sex with people, blah, 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 blah. Um, and they don't, aren't really reported as being negative. And so I guess my question is, could there be a different group that's interacting? You know, could it have been the Nordics early on and now we're dealing more with these greys and the reptilians and whoever else is out there? That is a possibility. There is no reason for us to think that all space visitors would come from the same place or even be of the same species. So um, certainly a plurality of space visitors is a very reasonable thing. Uh, in these um, negative abduction experiences that I was just talking about from the late 80s into the 90s, uh, they get all put together. Uh, the dominant group is clearly the greys who are running around like lab rats, as I mentioned. But they seem to be supervised by the Nordics and the reptilians. Uh, and so, yeah, they, they kind of converge uh, there. And it's almost as if the Nordics and the reptilians are giving the orders and the greys are taking the orders uh, David Jacobs, among others, reports uh, this kind of thing. I have to frankly say I just don't know what to make of that. Um, I explained what I can, but I cannot explain what's going on there. They're aliens for hire. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Maybe, okay, those you know. Nordics, uh, maybe those Nordics are actually gigolos uh, during Mardi Gras. I don't know. Yeah. You know, we need to just, like, come up with something and then just put it out there like, oh, well, this is it, and maybe we can start a movement. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> so now, why do you think – oh, go ahead, go ahead. I, uh, well, hopefully, Dr. Reed, I'm going to answer the next question you were going to ask. Maybe my intuition is working. So Maybe. You know, yeah, I'm going to assume your question is, well, why do I think we had this turn to the negative? Could that be your question? <laughs> well, no, but that's, that's a better follow-on than what I, where I was going. All right. Here's Ted's answer. Now, I may be wrong. It's very hypothetical, but here's my answer. Let's go back to Betty and Barney Hill, whom you mentioned. And I put them in the abductee category, not the contactee category. Contactees tended to develop ideologies and develop followings. Betty and Barney Hill did not. Uh, do that. Uh, they were traumatized initially by their experience. And here is what is so important about the Betty and Barney Hill case. Hypnotic regression. If you may remember, eventually they found their way into the office of uh, Benjamin Simon, who was a Boston, Boston psychiatrist. And he used hypnotic regression to go back uh, to retrieve Betty and Barney Hill's forgotten memories. And mm -hmm. that's how Dr. Simon was able to get the account of their abduction. Well, what happened after that? The technique, the investigative technique of hypnotic regression became uh, automatic amongst UFO investigators. So by the late 1960s and through the 1970s, Leo Sprinkle, um, Dr. Harder, I can't remember his first name, 
uh, and others were using hypnotic regression now on UFO abductees uh, in order to find out what had happened. Okay, that's chapter one. Chapter two, 1980, everything changes. What happens in 1980 is a book is published called Michelle Remembers, and the authors, co-authors, are a psychiatrist and patient. The psychiatrist's name is Pazder, that's his uh, family name, and the patient is Michelle. Now, they're using hypnotic regression not on a UFO experience, but rather on child sexual abuse and satanic ritual abuse. So, using hypnotic regression, they retrieve forgotten memories in Michelle of growing up uh, being sexually abused and participating in satanic rituals. Well, this book um, has, um, has Pazder and Michelle making... Uh, book tours, uh, first for the cloth bound and then to the paper bound. By 1982, we have an explosion of criminal prosecutions of the directors of preschools. Dr. Reeder, do you remember this? And uh, the McMartin Preschool trial, which began, I think, in 1982 and lasted until about 1987, the most expensive trial uh, at that time in Los Angeles County history was the prosecution of uh, a mother-son combination named McMartin who were running a preschool and they were accused by the parents of the children in the preschool of sexual abuse and satanic ritual abuse and the parents claimed that under the preschool was a subterranean ritual center in which they took the children down there to worship Satan and to um, receive uh, sexual abuse as part of that ritual. And this court trial lasted for a half a decade. And finally, the McMartins were declared by the jury to be innocent. Well, um, the two items uh, that uh, seemed to the jurors to prove their innocence was, number one, they bulldozed the preschool and underneath they didn't find any subterranean basement where these things allegedly took place. And then secondly, they discovered that the counselors who were employing uh, the interviews with the children were leading them, or basically mm-hmm. indoctrinating the children. At one point in the mid-1980s, there were a hundred cases around the country of preschool workers being prosecuted for this. A kind of mania, a kind of urban legend had uh, taken over uh, during this uh, period of time. So now I just want to say, I want to point out that's the context of the 1980s. You get to the last half of the 1980s, and out of New York City, you, come, you get four authors. You know, you get Whitley Strieber and Bud Hopkins and David Jacobs, and then uh, John Mack, who actually went down to New York from Boston to visit. And you get this spate of books now in which hypnotic regression is used to uncover forgotten memories of abductions that look kind of (laughs) like the sexual abuse abductions uh, of the uh, first half of that decade. And so my hypothetical question is, there could be a cultural carryover. Now, I have to say that when I ventured this hypothesis with uh, Dr. John Max. Uh, colleagues and researchers in Boston, they were, uh, they no, they said they were abho- they were abhorred by uh, my suggestion that there could be uh, any connection. But nevertheless, in the book, I want to just raise the circumstantial evidence that what we see in common here is the use of hypnotic regression, and uh, we see the abuse theme 
uh, arising in the 1980s with, uh, it's not that it was absent before, but it certainly had an accent and a dramatic impact in the 1980s that it had not had before. And so I want to ask to what extent then as the hybridizing model of the UFO abduction, to what extent really is that part of a larger cultural trend? So what do you think of my hypothesis there, Dr. Rita? I mean, I think it is entirely possible, you know, that there is a certain amount of leading that's going on. I mean, because you have to ask questions, you know, and I, it, it is totally possible. But then how would you, using that thesis, um, explain things like miss, the missing child syndrome or the implants that, you know, like the late Dr. Roger Lear was taking out or some of the other physical evidence that abductees end up coming back with? Well, that's a good question. And you know what? I don't have an answer. <laughs> woo <laughs> <laughs> I'm just doing the best I can with what I got. <laughs> um, I mean, I think the whole, you know, all right, how do I want to say this? There are stories that come out of, you know, I'm going to say mythology, but it's more, you know, there's myths, legends, folk tales, folklore, blah, blah. And so this comes more out of the, what would be considered the realm of folklore, um, about, uh, people being, you know, I don't even want to say abducted, but they end up going into the underworld or a doctor is called upon or a midwife is called upon to go into the underworld to tend to a woman who's had a child, but it's a halfling of these residents in the underworld, you know, and so the notion of, some kind of a hybridization, you know, I don't even want to say program, but, you know, of this mixed race thing, you know, I look at, well, you know, other people were talking about it hundreds of years ago, so is it possible? Maybe. I don't know. Um, but the whole notion of, you know, you had talked about earlier, um, you know, they want to have more feelings, you know, the rationale behind it. Um, I, I don't really get, you know, I don't understand the rationale of why they would do it. You know, why would they care? Well, I do not understand the rationale uh, either, but this connection you're drawing here between these UFO abductions and reports that we've gotten over the centuries uh, about other entities, not visitors from space, but other terrestrial uh, entities in folklore is, is a good one. And I don't know, Dr. Reed, if you remember Jacques Vallée or not, but Jacques Vallée was one of the prominent um, UFO investigators in the 1960s and into the 1970s. And um, he became a model for one of the characters in Spielberg's 1977 movie, uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Well, Volet started arguing already in the late 60s, I think, that there is so much continuity between UFO abduction accounts and fairies uh, in um, England, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. Ireland and other mm -hmm. uh, parts of Europe. And he kept showing the continuity between abduction reports and uh, these ancient um, uh, reports that come through folklore and things. And he wanted to argue that there is a large amount of continuity. Well, I think there was a subtlety in Valet's argument that um, a lot of the nuts and bolts kinds of people in ufology, uh, they didn't get it, you know, they, they couldn't tolerate it. And uh, there was a little bit of uh, skepticism in uh, Valet's approach. And so he looked like a non-believer, you know, non-believer in the extraterrestrial hypothesis. And so he, he, he got a little bit marginalized from mainstream uh, ufology, I think, uh, because of that. But 
I mention him because Dr. Rita, he really wants to make this point that beneath the science and technology that we associate with UFOs uh, is a common thread that takes us back to our ancestors and their myths and their folklores. And he didn't try to draw a conclusion. He didn't try to reduce it. But he said uh, the answer is going to be found somewhere uh, in here. I just want to say I want to listen to Valet. I don't know exactly where it's going to lead, but uh, I do think that there's a fair amount of wisdom there in showing the connection. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've been, all right, for over a year now, I've been working on a new book. I haven't actually written anything, but I've been doing a lot of research, and that's one of the topics that I've been researching is the mm-hmm. whole concept. And it's not just in um, England and Ireland and, you know, the British Isles. You actually find those reports in different cultures around the world, which oh, adds yes. additional credibility in my book that, you know, there's some bigger phenomena and it's not just a story that started here and kind of spread into the, you know, the right. neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah, you're going to find it uh, cross-culturally or multiculturally. No, which I always find really kind of cool myself. <laughs> um, you know, we were talking about the... Okay, so people have these negative experiences. Let's go back to this compare and contrast. So people have these negative experiences, but it doesn't seem like they come home with a message other than, ow. <laughs> you know, there, there's not, there's no message. You know, it's just the experience. Um, true statement so far? I think that's a true statement with the exception of John Mack uh, and John Mack turns the experience into a message and his message is the ecological ethic let's take care of our planet so you have to ask the abductees that whom John Mack interviewed did they come up with this message or is this John Mack's own spirituality that he is pinning on them? And I don't have an answer because I haven't gone back and interviewed those people that uh, whom he right. interviewed. But, but uh, I would say, apart from the John Mack thing, you're right. No message. Okay. But in these earlier ones, you know, it sounds like they had these messages that they came back with. Um, you know, and it's kind of like a multi-part commentary question. It's like, you know, it seems obvious that we don't listen. Um, you know, so any thoughts on why they wouldn't be more direct? I mean, you know, we already kind of threw out, or I threw out the whole prime directive idea. Um, but if they understand who we are, you know, and we're stupid, and we need somebody to smack us up the side of the head, you know, <laughs> You know, we need the ship to land on the White House lawn with a billboard that says save the planet, save the world, you know, save the cheerleader. Um, and if they, you know, I, why aren't they being more direct? Any thoughts? Um, obviously, my mind is... Uh, is, is <laughs> Processing, <working>. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I'm wrong, uh, that at least in part these messages are like the messages of the prophets in ancient Israel um, then uh, if we just imagine ourselves back there in ancient Israel and the prophet Jeremiah or Isaiah comes along and says um, you guys have been screwing up and uh, your uh, Jerusalem's going to get destroyed Unless you repent, repent and do X, Y, and Z, you know, take care of the widow, feed the poor, uh, etc. Uh, and, and of course, they don't repent, and uh, Jerusalem gets uh, clobbered. Uh, in some way, the message that I think is delivered by the UFO knots uh, through our terrestrial, you know, mediators is a lot like that. And it's the kind of message that you and I can ignore. <laughs> if they ignored it in ancient Israel, why not today? I, I closed the book with a, with a story, a true story, that happened in Great uh, Britain. 
And uh, it was November 26, 1977 on the South England Television Network, about 5 p.m. The programming gets interrupted. And a strange voice says to the TV audience, this is the voice of Asteron. So Asteron claims to represent an intergalactic association that is deeply concerned about the welfare of life on Earth, and he has come to warn the people of England that they only have a short time to live, that to avoid total annihilation, that Earthlings need to put away weapons of war, uh, Earthlings need to embrace one another, learn how to live together in peace. And after about six minutes, Asteron's voice was eliminated, and the regular programming went back. And, of course, the TV station was bombarded by the frightened audience. There was a mood of panic amongst the viewers and things like that. And so the uh, station set about to investigate what had happened. Uh, The following uh, Tuesday... A broadcaster for the South England Television Network announced that the results of their investigation. Um, and in fact, they didn't know how it happened, but <laughs> they guaranteed that that message of Asteron to put down our weapons of war and strive for world peace, that message would never be heard again on this station. <laughs> So um, I think uh, that sort of uh, answers your question, Dr. Rita, that it's a message that on the one hand is common. Uh, We understand it. We know this message. And it doesn't matter whether it comes from a U.S. senator or a 12-year-old making a speech uh, in a school program or whether it comes from a UFO not or from an angel. It's still uh, the right message. But uh, we on Earth are going to continue to find ways to uh, ignore it uh, if, uh, if we can. So uh, even the authority of a spaceling getting out of a spacecraft on the mall in Washington, D.C. probably will not persuade us uh, to embrace world peace. Um, anyway, I think that's that's... The way I look at it, I don't know if that persuades you or not, Dr. Rita, but that's the way I think about it. Well, I mean, I think they'd have a much better chance. You know, when, whenever that topic comes up about the, the, a message, you know, it always makes me think of, you know, that song, Jesus Christ Superstar. You know, why'd you come out? There's no mass communication, you know? Yes. Uh, in some ways, the uh, that theme in Jesus Christ Superstar is sort of like this, yeah. Mm-hmm. So I'm looking at the clock, and there was one other topic we were going to get into, and I definitely want to get into it, um, and it's about the government. You know, and there are many individuals who contend that world governments are in cahoots with the ETs in one giant galactic or intergalactic conspiracy. So what do you think? Any truth to those uh, thoughts, beliefs, let ideas? Let me just say I would hope that that would be true. Although chances are the people that you're speaking of probably are terrorized uh, by that thought. Uh, No, I don't think there's any evidence that you and I could rely upon that uh, could sustain that kind of a conspiracy. Rather, what I think, uh, and this we see in both the contactees and in some of the abductees, uh, is that Uh, aliens would like to see a world government, one that could maintain peace and health for the planet, but it's impossible because we cannot get our political leaders to cooperate with one another. So um, I, 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 let me just say, I'm not going to believe that what you just reported is, is credible. You think it's credible? No, I, I don't. No. Yeah, no, I don't think there is a conspiracy between aliens and a uh, clandestine terrestrial government. I wish there were, but there isn't. 
So what about the whole idea of like the back engineering and that much of the technology we have has been back engineered? I take that up in my book uh, with some uh, specific issues. Usually that claim uh, about reverse engineering is associated with the Roswell uh, case. It's not exclusively that, but that's the primary example of what it is that you're talking about. And uh, a lot of this was um, uh, was put out there by a guy by the name of Corso, who in 1997, to get ready for the 50th anniversary of the Roswell uh, uh, crash uh, incident, Corso put this book out in which he listed a number of uh, examples of technology that were jump-started, allegedly, by UFO uh, technology. Uh, he even claimed that in the crashed flying saucer at Roswell, there was uh, a prototype of a laser, and that the laser was the product of a jump start of alien technology. Well, uh, I happen to know the guy who got the Nobel Prize for inventing the laser. Actually, there were two of them, and this is one of them. His name is Charlie Towns a physicist here in Berkeley at the University of California. And uh, so I asked him, I said, you know, Charlie, uh, tell me, um, uh, did you invent the laser or did you get the technology from uh, outer space? He said, what are you talking about? (laughs) So as we pursued the conversation, uh, it became clear that the path to the laser was a long um, uh, trial and error kind of research program. And he did say, I will have to add this, that the actual design of the laser, laser was a religious experience. Uh, that is to say that they had uh, been frustrated because they tried this, that, and the next thing. And finally, one day he was sitting on a uh, bench uh, with his paper bag uh, lunch in Washington and Uh, He had a vision, and there was the laser, and I'm told that there's now a bronze bench in Washington to celebrate the time and the place in which the design of the laser was revealed um, to Dr. Towns. But it was not revealed by a ufonaut. It was revealed. But how do you know it was it wasn't you know, a non corporeal one that was just by jumping into his brainwave? Well he doesn't. Let me let me just say he didn't describe it that way. He was very <laughs> thankful for the revelation, but he was not sympathetic to my suggestion <laughs> that it came from outer space. And be that as it may, I said, Charlie, please write me a letter. <laughs> so he did and I have a copy of the letter in the book. So uh, the the bottom line uh, is that, at least in the case of the laser, no, it was not jump-started by alien technology. On the other hand, uh, there are instances in which we take giant leaps forward in technology in which amazing things happen to the human mind. That's true. It's just that uh, there wouldn't be any reason to connect these amazing things with extraterrestrials, at least that's the way I look at it. Not even Velcro, huh? huh? <laughs> okay, I'll take okay, that I'll as a no. Know. Okay. <laughs> um, so, if, you know, let's say E.T. did land on the White House lawn or on the Kremlin lawn or wherever. You know, my backyard, my new backyard. Your new um, backyard. Get that stranger out of there. Make room for E.T. to land. Well, I have room now. My last backyard, my little side patio is bigger than my old backyard. So that's very cool. (laughs) Anyway, um, you know, but if we did have that kind of contact, what do you think would happen to society in general? I mean, I think a lot of people believe in, you know, extraterrestrials or the possibility of extraterrestrials. So, I don't know that they would be necessarily surprised short of, you know, having a war of the world type scenario with these machines killing everybody and taking them hostage. Um, But, you know, what do you think would be the outcome of that kind of a situation? 
Well, if we could uh, kick it up one level of abstraction and just ask, what would be the impact on terrestrial society if we confirmed knowledge of an intelligent civilization existing elsewhere in space? Whether they visit us or not, uh, that actually is a question that scientists currently are investigating. The Royal Society in London uh, made this a uh, question of the year in the year uh, 2010, actually. And um, uh, both SETI and NASA scientists are interested in uh, trying to determine in advance what the social impact of the knowledge of ETI would be. So uh, your question uh, fits within this m very large uh, study area. And my piece of it has been the question, what might the impact be on religion, terrestrial religion? We've had these religions, you know, for uh, hundreds of years, in some cases thousands of years. And uh, two, um, two forces have uh, suggested that religion would f face a crisis or collapse. One is the media, and the other one are a certain members of the scientific community who want to say, as soon as we meet them in outer space, then religion on Earth is over. You know, the crisis uh, will not be uh, absorbed. So... I got curious about this and launched a, a survey uh, called the Peters ETI Religious Crisis Survey, and you can get access to it at my website, tedstimelytake.com, in which um, we, uh, by we, I had a, had a doctoral uh, graduate student uh, who uh, helped me. Um, we ask, uh, here's a question we ask, the, uh, the most important one is, if you, who have self-selected as a religious person, if you were convinced that we share our universe with another extraterrestrial civilization, would your religious beliefs be challenged? Would you face a crisis? And would your religious beliefs collapse? Well, um, the overwhelming majority, we're talking about 90 plus percent in all, virtually every religious tradition that we looked at that uh, was reflected in the survey either found this to be a neutral issue or a positive issue. Less than 8% uh, were worried uh, about a crisis. Now, we're talking about Roman Catholics. We're talking about mainline Protestants. We're talking about evangelical Protestants, which include fundamentalists. Um, they all were the same roughly 92% to 8%. Um, we also uh, got statistically uh, useful data uh, from Buddhists and from Mormons, and in those two groups, the response was 100%. That is to say, bring them on, you know. We're, and uh, I, I loved one remark by a, a mainline Protestant who said, I'll share my pew with an alien any day. Um, <laughs> And even we saw amongst the Muslims who responded and the Hindus who responded a common remark that went something like this. This universe is really big and there is no reason to think that Earth is the only place that God or Allah uh, would think is important. In fact, it's arrogant to think that uh, God is concerned about us alone. So that was, uh, it was like overwhelming. I mean, there wasn't even uh, a, a serious uh, challenge that needed to be mitigated in terms of people's self-understanding. Now, uh, there's one more interesting piece of data that came out of this. We asked even if your own religious or non-religious beliefs would remain intact, what do you think is going to happen to those other religious people? And those who self-declared non-religious were the most interesting. Now, in our non-religious group, we included both atheists as well as those people who think of themselves as being spiritual but not belonging to a religious tradition. And 
if I had to do the survey again, I'd try to distinguish those two groups. But uh, in this survey, they were together. And those two groups uh, said, basically, oh, well, my non-religious beliefs would not be hurt at all, but those other people, those religious people, they're going to face a crisis and their religion is going to collapse. So uh, what I think is funny about this is that people who are self-declared as religious, regardless of their religious tradition, um, are happy to welcome an alien into their church or their religious or their mosque or whatever. But those who are non-religious are worried that those religious people, they're the ones that are going to have a problem. So um, uh, my uh, conclusion after all this is that more than likely, if we were to wake up tomorrow, confirm the existence of an extraterrestrial intelligent civilization, you would not see any major uh, changes in the traditional religions uh, that we have. Uh, and uh, well, you know, one of my missions is, uh, frankly, I would like, if I could, you know, to get uh, intellectuals from a variety of different religious traditions to come together and talk about this and see if they could provide an articulation of just why this happens to be the case and what they think about it, uh, just in case we're going to wake up some morning, we're going to need it. Well, I mean, it's, I'm trying to think which pope it was. You know, we've had a few lately. Um, you know, whether it was John Paul or, all right, we have Francis now, the one in between. The one who, that was the uh, one Cardinal Ratzinger, who was Benedict the Sixteenth. Benedict, Benedict, you know, I think it was him that said it, you know, that they were open to the concept of, you know, intelligent life in the universe because it really didn't interfere with their concept of God, you know, and so, and I, you know, I mean, God made, if God made everything, you know, God made the aliens too, so, you know, I mean, I can see how they could wrap their mind around it pretty easily, you know, taken in that context. Well, in the survey, certainly Roman Catholic lay people uh, think just the way uh, you described. I did have the privilege for a decade and a half to work with uh, Pope John Paul II on issues having to do with uh, science and theology. He actually was very interested uh, in that topic. Uh, Benedict XVI seemed to be uninterested. Uh, but now uh, Pope Francis I is quite uh, interested. Um, a lot of people are unaware that the Vatican has had its own observatory at, in principle for centuries. And uh, certainly since the Second World War, uh, Vatican scientists um, supervised by the Jesuits have pers been pursuing uh, scientific research about galaxy formation and other issues having to do with uh, deep space. They've been doing this for a while. And as you can imagine, the question of extraterrestrial life is almost an everyday conversation uh, amongst the Vatican Observatory Jesuits. About two weeks ago, uh, on a Monday, uh, Pope Francis I was... Uh, delivering, delivering a homily at a chapel in the Vatican. And uh, one of his themes, you may have noticed, is he wants Catholics around the world to sort of broaden their horizons, to get more inclusive. And uh, so in this homily, he, he has a moment in which he says, now suppose a spaceship were to land, and out of this spaceship uh, are aliens, and he described them as little green men, while well, nobody thinks of little green men. But that's what was there in his sermon. And uh, suppose they asked if they could be baptized. Should we baptize them? Uh, that was uh, in his homily. So uh, there is a kind of liberty or freedom uh, for that kind of speculation on the part of uh, Francis I. Uh, Guy Consolmagno is a Jesuit brother uh, from the uh, Vatican Observatory. Uh, developed that a little bit further, a little bit more theologically. He wants to say, 
uh, well, if they are endowed with intelligence and free will, and if they request baptism, of course we're going to. So uh, there's a little bit of theology going on there, and the bottom line in all of this is I cannot expect Roman Catholics from the Pope on down are going to have a problem. It's just, Mm -hmm. there's not going to be a problem, right? They just need to stay in their own part of heaven. (laughs) (laughs) You know, it's segregated there. (laughs) Right, right, right. So, yeah. So do you uh, think that, do you think that concepts, you know, like you were just talking about, I mean, we, we hear of world leaders making these references to, you know, our space brothers, you know, the famous Ronald Reagan speech, et cetera, um, is possibly preparing us because there is this government knowledge that UFOs do exist, you know, because of Roswell and, you know, extraterrestrials that are preparing us for disclosure at some point? Um, no, I don't. Um, it is the case that some of our presidents have had UFO experiences, uh, Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan uh, are on that list. Um, it's also the case that they have had oversight of NASA and in some cases even of SETI and the exploration and the search for life in the universe. And for the, I don't think of a president since Kennedy. Uh, none of the presidents have gotten excited about space in general. Uh, let alone intelligent life in particular, beginning already with Nixon, the idea of shutting down the space program uh, and uh, saving the money for other things has really been uh, what has dominated uh, presidents in both Republican and uh, Democratic parties. So uh, the, the last time we put a man on the moon was, you know, that's what, 40 years ago or something like that. Um, and uh, to squeeze a little money out of Washington to even look at space uh, seems to be uh, quite a difficult thing to do. So basically, no, I don't trust our presidents. I don't think they have much interest. And um, I uh, wonder how much they know or how much they don't know. If you may remember, Jimmy Carter had promised during his 1976 campaign once he got in the White House, he would re- release all that secret information. Well, he got into the White House. The UFO people went and said, okay, we want disclosure now. Dish it out. And he didn't even handle it personally. He turned to NASA and said, you, you tell the public. And uh, NASA, of course, had nothing to say of, um, of any uh, consequence. And the whole thing died. Uh, now, one could argue, oh, that's just a sign of a conspiracy. Um, I, I think it's just a sign of a lack of interest uh, myself. So, Dr. Rita, do you have an opinion on that one? Well, I mean, you know, one of the opinions that I've heard from a number of my guests, which I think is a good one, is, you know, if there is no conspiracy, it's the most, you know, or if there isn't something going on, it's the most studied thing that isn't going on that we've ever done. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I, I tend to fall in line with those who want to say, yes, Uncle Sam does have knowledge of UFOs, but they categorize that knowledge with national security issues. That the government isn't studying UFOs because they're interested in space. Uh, only insofar as they pose a threat or potential threat to national security. And when they've satisfied themselves that it's not a threat to national security, they don't care anymore. I, I happen to think that's probably what's going on with Uncle Sam. Uh, and uh, I, I can't prove that because it's hard to prove uh, something that's secret. But that's, that's what seems to be the case in my opinion. Well, you know, if everybody knew about it, it wouldn't be a secret anymore. <laughs> I wonder. So Ted, we, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. We have time. Oh, I wonder if, in the human spirit, there that we have a yearning for power, uh, not to have power. Wonder. Like, uh, yeah, wonder. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 
And uh, we would love to have this power be benevolent, of course. And here's here's my thought. Uh, why why do we have a sustained theory that Uncle Sam in Washington, as well as the governments of other countries, are hiding this sh- earth-shattering information? And that conspiracy, belief in conspiracy, goes back to 1950 at least, maybe even to 1947, why do, why do we want to think that Uncle Sam has in its possession flying saucers, the connection between heaven and earth, the relationship between the planet and the gods? I think it's because we want to believe that our government's omnipotent. And if our government looks like it's fragile and feeble, well, really, behind the scenes, they know it all. Um, I just, uh, I just uh, speculate about that one a little bit. Well, on that note, I have to say we need to wrap it up. We have about a minute left. So if somebody wants to get your book, you know, I wish I had a copy of it so I could actually read it. But <laughs> I'm glad that I got to talk to you up close and in person. Uh, UFOs, God's Chariots, where, where do we send them? Well, uh, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and the other uh, online uh, distributors uh, have it. You can buy it from my website, tedstimelytake.com. If you want to, you don't have to. It's not going to be hard to find. It's going to be easier to find, huh? If they buy it from your website, do they come directly from you, and do you autograph them? Um, no. I, uh, okay, don't do just that. checking. It, yeah. <laughs> Amazon or Barnes & Noble are still the ones that send it out. So, Okay, okay. Um, and let's see, anything, just very briefly, anything exciting coming up for you? Well, um, these days uh, I happen to be um, uh, visiting a number of radio shows to talk about UFOs, God's chariots, but... Uh, we have a research project that will uh, last another year or two in Berkeley on astrotheology and astroethics. We want to know uh, cool. what the religious implications are of ETI when uh, we want to know before we meet them. So, uh, yeah, that's exciting for me and my colleagues, my uh, faculty colleagues and my student colleagues. Were, uh, it's never dull in Berkeley. Never. Anyway, Ted, we need to go. Uh, say your website one more time, and then we're going to wrap it up. Ted's Timely Take dot com. One word for Ted's Timely Take. Okay. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Ted. All right, talk it to has you been then. a pleasure. Good talking to you. Okay. Bye bye. This is in your new house. Bye bye. Thank you. That's Ted Peters. His book is UFOs. God's Cherry. His website is. TedTimelyTake.com. I'm Dr. Reed Louise. This is Just Energy Radio. Till next week, be blessed. Join host Dr. Rita Louise each week at this time for Just Energy Radio. 